جميل ما شاء الله ما شاء الله الله يا أخويك سنت ما شاء الله ما شاء الله ولا سوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ما شاء الله اللهم اهدنا ونعمت يا الله ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر الله والديك فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما الساء ربك فحدث صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى احسنتم 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 طيب الله فاسكم Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you all for coming to our Arabian lecture series on the Chronicles of Karbala by Father Christopher Klohesi. Father Christopher is a South African Catholic priest who holds a BST from the Pontifical U Urban University in Rome and a PhD from the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies, PISAI, also in Rome. He is at present a resident faculty member of PISAI, lecturing there in Shi'i Islamic Studies, Quran and Shi'i is uh, sorry, and Islamic Ethics, and is a visiting lecturer at the Pontifical Beda College, also in Rome, where he lectures in fundamental theology, ecclesiology, and Mariology. This year's lecture series is sponsored on behalf of the Marhumin displayed on the TV outside, located just outside the chapel. Please can we recite a Surah Fatiha for these and all other Marhumin. Al Fatiha. Also on the note of health and safety, in the case of, of, of any emergencies, the fire exits are located at the back of the chapel behind me over here. Also in the main area by the foyer and later down by the dining room as well. Without further ado, I would like to invite Father Christopher to deliver tonight's lecture. Can we please welcome him with the loudest of salawats? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.
So everything that I am going to say to you tonight revolves around one single sentence found written in Arabic, and it's a sentence we'll keep coming back to. Atarju ummatun katalat Hussein shifa atajiddihi yawm al-hisab. Can a nation which killed Hussein hope in the intercession of his grandfather on the day of reckoning, the day of accounting, Yom al Hisab. What I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to attempt to present you with two texts written centuries apart in which this thought or this element revolves. And the first of these texts is taken from the Hebrew scriptures, but it's a text that's written in Aramaic and Hebrew. It's the fifth chapter of the book of the prophet Daniel. And it tells this well-known, certainly amongst the Hebrew community, this terrible story of a man called Belshazzar, who was not king, but who was the Babylonian regent while his father was away. And Belshazzar gives this terrible dinner party. And in the course of the dinner party, while he has, the scripture says, while he has been drinking and is under the influence of alcohol, Belshazzar orders that all the sacred objects that were stolen from the temple should be brought to him so that he and his guests can use them to drink wine from and to, to, and to praise the gods who they worshipped, the gods of iron and bronze and gold. And as they are doing this, a, a finger appears and begins to write on the wall of Belshazzar's palace. And it's a sentence that we'll look at later, but basically what, this, what it writes is, God has numbered your days. You have been weighed on the scale, the way somebody would weigh a piece of silver, and you have been found wanting, and therefore your kingdom is to be taken from you. And in fact, that very night, Belshazzar would die. Now, the book was written in a, a mixture of Hebrew and Aramaic, and the text of, uh, that we're going to see now is dated between 167 and 164 BC, so that the two texts we're looking at tonight are hundreds and hundreds of years apart. And it belongs to a book, the book of Daniel, which is really a book of resistance. So already, in a sense, the book of Daniel is in some way linked to al Hussein, whose resistance ends in the Battle of Karbala. That's the text very quickly. King Belshazzar held a great festival for thousands of his lords. By lords here is meant his, the people who work for him. He was drinking wine in the presence of these thousands under the influence of wine. It's a very important sentence that we can underline. Under the influence of wine, Belshazzar commanded that they bring the vessels of gold and silver that his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had stolen from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and all of his guests might drink from them. So these vessels are brought. And as they drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, so they're committing shirk here at this moment. It's the second act of blasphemy. The fingers of a human hand appeared and began writing on the plaster of the wall of the palace next to the lampstand. And when the king saw these fingers writing or this finger writing, he was filled with terror. So they send for Daniel because Daniel is a young man in the kingdom who is known to be able to interpret dreams. And, and he is promised all kinds of riches by the king. And he says to the king, I don't need any of your riches. I'm going to read the sentence for you. And then I'm going to interpret. So he reads the sentence which is written in the Chaldean language, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parsin. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Therefore, your kingdom is to be divided and it's going to be given over to the Medes and to the Persians. Now, the reason I present this text to you from the Hebrew scriptures is because I came across some years ago while I was researching something, I came across a selection of Islamic texts recorded by the Sunni and by the Shia. And that's the second set of texts I'm offering tonight after this one, which describe a very similar story. And although each text or each version or each narrative carries different details and different places where it happens, the same strand runs through them. And I've identified four different sets of these Islamic texts, just to make it easier. There is a series of narratives 
of these soldiers who are traveling with the head of Al Hussein from Kufa, uh, from, from Karbala to Kufa, or from Kufa to Damascus. And these soldiers stop for an evening, and there something terrible happens to them. The second set of narratives is almost the same story, except the set of soldiers stops in a Christian monastery. And there are a number of stories about these monasteries, but in this particular monastery, they are fed by the monks, and the head of Al Hussein is placed near them on a spear while they're eating and drinking. There's a third set of narratives, and this one concerns a group of Muslim scholars who are in Byzantium, and there they find a Byzantine church, and in the church on the wall, they find this sentence that we read earlier. And fourthly, there's a set of narratives about somebody, possibly a Christian, but possibly also a Muslim, digging a well, and digging this well, they find written on a plate of gold or on a plate of silver that same sentence. And so it's these four sets of narratives that I want to try to look at very quickly tonight. The first of these is about a group of soldiers from the army which defeats the, the, the men of Al Hussein and finally kills Al Hussein at Karbala. They're traveling from Kufa, I mean from Karbala to Kufa, that is to the palace of Ibn Ziyad, carrying with them the head of Al Hussein and sometimes maybe the heads of the other martyrs as well. In some narratives, they're in fact already leaving Kufa and on their way to Damascus. This text is first reported in a Sunni book. Uh, and, and I'm reading the, the, the version from Al Haythami. When Al Hussein was killed, they cut off his head. They were sitting down on the first stage of the journey, suggesting, therefore, somewhere between Karbala and Kufa, drinking wine, you can underline that because it occurs again, and mocking or striking the head when an iron pen appeared and wrote in a line of blood, cannonation that killed Al Hussein hope for the intercession of his grandfather on the day of recompense or the day of reward, Yawm al-Hisab. And the, the earliest narratives have these men grabbing the head and fleeing from where they've stopped and carrying on with their journey. What interests me about this is that it's a, it's a story that appears very, very late in the Shi'i texts and very, very early in the Sunni texts. So, for example, a Sunni like Ibn Asakir, the historian, he records it, but it's only much later that you find it in the Shia text. In fact, it's Ibn Shahra Shub, who is the first to record the story, and he claims to be transmitting it from al-Bayhaqi, who is a Sunni, except I looked in al-Bayhaqi and I can't find it. So, so he may have made a mistake in his transmission. Question is, why is it that the Shia texts are so late in recording this? It could well be that in the early years they were concentrating on other things, qualifying the, the, the imama, qualifying the, the, the question of, of who becomes imam and when and how, qualifying some of the early theology before they began to turn their attention to some of these events, which they took often from the Sunni texts. In fact, the sentence that most often occurs some Shi authors, and I'm thinking especially of the famous Kamul Ziyara, takes it out of the story and claims that this is a sentence that was heard recited on the night air in Medina, but also in Mecca and maybe even Jerusalem on the night that Al Hussein was killed. But this time, they, they, the, but, but the story begins in Mecca. It begins in Mecca with a man who is overheard praying God Please forgive me, although I know you will not. And from that prayer in the sanctuary of Mecca develops this story. The man, we will discover, is so shocked by his sin that he can't recount it in the sanctuary and says, if I'm going to tell you my sin, we must leave the sanctuary. It reminds you again of the idea of blasphemy that runs through the story of sacred things being mocked. In fact, in fact, the name of our, our regent in the Hebrew story, Belshazzar, means may the god Bel be saved and praised. So even his name is an act of blasphemy. So this text is found, first of all, most completely in a man called Al-Rawandi, 
Now, there are two al-Rawandis. One of them was a Shia, and he apostatized and became an atheist. That's not the one we're talking about. This is a more famous Rawandi who's, the, who's um, a 6th, 12th century Shi scholar, philosopher. And he has the story narrated by a famous Sunni narrator by the name of Amash, the, the blind one, a man who was known because he was short-sighted, but also was known for his humor and his sarcasm. But he's the one narrating the story. I was doing tawaf, writes Amash, or narrates Amash, and I saw a man near me praying, Lord, forgive me even though I know you will not. So I got up and walked over to him and said, hey you, you're in the sanctuary. You have no right to pray such a prayer. This is the sanctuary of God. It's the sanctuary of his messenger. These are holy days, so don't ever despair of forgiveness. And he replied to me, but my sin is very great. And I said, bigger than the mountains. He said, bigger than any mountains. I'll tell you what it is if you want, but we need to leave the sanctuary. So they leave the sanctuary, and then this man tells his story. I was one of the army of Umar bin Sa'ad when Al Hussein bin Ali was killed. And then I was one of the 40 that carried his head from Kufa to Yazid. So we're in the second stage of the journey. On the way to Syria, we stopped at a Christian monastery. We put the head on a spear had sentries stand guard over it, and then the monks gave us food. We sat down to eat, and as we were eating, a line in blood was written on the monastery wall. It's the famous line, can a nation that killed Hussein hope for his grandfather's intercession on the day of recompense? We were deeply uncomfortable, so some of us got up hoping we could catch hold of this hand, but it disappeared. So we sat down to eat again, and then, Rawandi, unlike most other transmitters, adds a second sentence. As we sat down, the hand came back, and then it wrote, No, by God, there is no intercessor for them on that day. They will be tormented. So again, he said, we got up and tried to grab the hand, and it disappeared. We came back to our food, and a third time, the hand appeared and wrote, They killed Hussein because they are deviants, and their judgment is at odds with the judgment of the Book of God. These editions of Rawandi interest me a great deal because it becomes not just a general warning about a nation who killed Al Hussein, but, but a promise of divine disapproval and divine punishment. It's not just that they're not going to be interceded for, they are going to be tormented. The man praying without hope is a story that resonates through the texts because the texts of this, this particular incident are all about punishment that is coming. In, in Rawandi's report, the, the narrator interrupts his own prayer, or his own tawaf, to approach and give advice to this man saying, you can't lose hope, but in fact, the story does not end with hope. It ends with a promise of torment. What interests me too is that Rawandi doesn't mention a pen or a finger, just writing that appears. It seems curious to me that he leaves out the story because the pen is of great importance. When the pen is mentioned, it does remind you of Surat al-Alaq, God who talked with a pen. The symbolic, the symbolic message being that maybe people have forgotten and the same God has to reteach a message. But when it's a finger, it reminds of a story in the Christian scriptures of Jesus who writes on the ground a sentence with a finger saying that somebody's sins are forgiven. So the third set is about a church in Byzantium. And it's found in a number of transmitters. We made a foray or we went on an expedition into Byzantium. We entered one of there, that is the Eastern Christian churches. And we found a verse written. And then again, the same sentence, except for one change. Not umma anymore. But now the word for group, either ma'shar or usba. Can a group that killed al Hussein, hoped for the intercession of his grandfather on the day of recompense. So we said to the priests, when was this written? And they said, 300 years before your prophet came. In some texts, Ibn Asakir, 600 years before your prophet came. 
And the sentence is either written on the wall of the church or it's written in a book that they find in the church. Byzantium refers, of course, to the Eastern Christians. They would have called themselves Rome, Romans, but it really is Byzantium because, because they were the extension of the Roman Empire. And then finally, a fourth set of verses about somebody digging in the ground, and this is found in a number of texts. al Majlisi takes it from Ibn Namal Hilli in his Muthir al-Ahzan. We made a raid, we took some prisoners. Among them there was an old Christian. We treated him with kindness and we were friendly to him. And he said to us, my father told me on the authority of his fathers, so the form of is Isnad is there, although it's a Christian reciting, that they were digging a well in the land of Byzantium. And 300 years before Muhammad the Arab was sent and they struck a stone on which was written a verse in the language of Al-Musnad, which is the language of Seth, the son of Noah, can a band, Usba, not an Ummah, but Usba, can a band that killed al Hussein hope for the intercession of his grandfather on the day of recompense? It's very noteworthy, this change from Ummah to Mashar, although Mashar is used quite often to mean nation, then to Usba, and Usba really means a gang. And it means a gang or a group that is bigoted or fanatic, not a, a nice gang of people. So, so it, it is of great interest to ask what the author means. Does he mean it's not the Ummah, but a small bigoted fanatic Usba gang that killed al Hussein, Or does he mean that the Ummah is an Usba? So some reciters have got into trouble recently for suggesting that the Ummah is an Usba. In other words, a bad gang of people. But the suggestion here could well be reducing the threat, not against the whole ummah for the death of Al-Hussein, but against a small radical band. Ibn Shahrashub carries the second of these narratives on the authority of Anas bin Malik, who was a well-known transmitter. Again, a man from Najran, so almost certainly a Christian, if he was from Najran, dug a hole in which he found a gold tablet on which was written the same verse, followed by the additions. They came to him with deviant judgment because their judgment was not the same as the judgment of the Book of God. Then it addresses Yazid. Yazid, you are going to be punished by the most merciful, and what a punishment yours will be. That's being transmitted from Anas bin Malik, who is one of the early and well-known Sunni transmitters, and they find the name Yazid in the text. So the book of Daniel is, is a theology of resistance. It functions in the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, as a discourse that invites people to confront the thing that is unjust. But in Daniel, it is always a non-violent confrontation. N resistance through obedience to God's covenant. Even having occasionally to compromise the covenant. And an example is that Daniel used Aramaic and Hebrew in his book to try and compromise a little bit. The theology built around Karbala is exactly the same. It is a theology of resistance. But unlike the Daniel text, it launches a group of people into a, a violent situation of confrontation, if you like, the Husseini model of Islam against the Yazidi model of Islam. In this writing of the, of the, on the monastery wall, there's a specific link between the Belshazzar event and the, the event of these soldiers. Daniel doesn't tell us who the author is, he just says that God sent the hand. So it's not the hand of God that is seen, but a hand sent by God. This element is different in the Arabic text, it's a pen, a pen of iron, but it's not the hand of God. No way do the Arabic text say that it was God's hand. What always interests me are the similarities between these two sets of texts, the Aramaic text and the Islamic text. I'm interested firstly in the question of blasphemy. That the, the vessels brought from the Temple of Jerusalem and used for a drunken party are, in a sense, an act of blasphemy against the holy things of God, in the same way that the mockery 
of the head of Al-Hussein was an act of blasphemy against a holy object, something that is holy to God. While the writing on the wall of Belshazzar is directed at Belshazzar himself, it's an indictment of his own uselessness as a regent, the soldiers and others who were associated with Al-Hussein's death are not the recipients of the threat. It is the whole Ummah that is threatened by the writing. Um, there are some scholars who report the verses as addressed directly to Yazid bin Muawiyah himself. He, he had drunk a qual quantity of wine, says the text, when a hand emerged in the wall in front of him and wrote these verses. But I think that that's a text that has been borrowed later from the Hebrew scriptures because, because there it is directed to the king himself who is drinking and written on his own wall. The consumption of alcohol plays a major role. Um, Yazid himself was accused even by the Sunni texts of having a problem with alcohol. But what interests me is that the sentence in the Aramaic, Belshazzar, under the influence, in Aramaic that means a man who has lost the capacity to be regent. He no longer has the capacity to be a governor. And it becomes a key element in the story that it's under that lack of ability that he loses his kingdom. It's curious that all of these stories take place in the context of eating and drinking. Eating and drinking generally is meant to be a celebration, but these celebrations in the court of Yazid and in the monastery turn into a situation of hopelessness and terror as in the middle of the celebration, everything turns negative. And then finally, in, in both places, these stories take place in public places, a banquet hall, a monastery, or just a location on the road between Kar Karbala and Kufa but they are eyewitness accounts, the soldiers themselves or the members eating and drinking in the palace of Belshazzar. The writing can't be understood by anyone. Belshazzar has to get Daniel to interpret the writing, and in the, the later stories, especially of the writing on the wall in the church in Byzantium, they have to ask local Syrians to interpret the Syriac for them because they can't read it, or the language called Al-Musnad, the language of Seth, has to be interpreted by locals because the, the Muslim discoverers can't read it. So in conclusion, of course, the, the writing on the wall of Belshazzar marks the end of his reign and the end of his life. In the Islamic texts, it's not about that sort of punishment. It's about an eternal punishment, a spiritual punishment through the loss of the all-important intercession of the prophet is the crucial element of those stories. Belshazzar dies that night having lost his kingdom, but the soldiers and others who are threatened and, and all who took part in the killing of Hussein, it's a spiritual punishment after death that awaits them. I suppose the sentence read by Daniel to Belshazzar could apply equally to those who killed the prophet's grandson. God has found you wanting. You've been weighed on the scale and you have been found lacking and therefore everything is going to be taken away from you. So I leave those two stories with you tonight to think about. Um, I find them interesting because I think they have grown up without being simply borrowed, they've grown up as parallel stories in two very distant traditions about the same element of injustice being punished by an act of God. So thank you for, your, for being here tonight. Thank you, Father Christopher, for your talk. Can I call on Elsie Gale from the Interfaith Community to recite some few lines of poetry? Just before I do, a bit of a background. Elsie is a practicing independent midwife with over 30 years of experience in the NHS. She's a board member for Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health NHS Foundation Trust. Elsie has supported women, women globally through, her, uh, through their birthing journeys and will be speaking about humanizing birth and reproductive justice. Can we please welcome Elsie with a loud salawat. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala.
So good evening, everyone. I'm really very honored to have been asked to speak with you this evening following Professor Father Christopher Floretti. It is an honor to be asked to speak at this illustrious event. I want to speak, not poetry, but from the oceans of my experience from my campaigning work over the years as a midwife. I will be speaking to human, humanizing birth and reproductive justice, the importance of women in communities, the importance of communities to nurture and protect their women, <coughs> the power of mothering, the reciprocal and critical power of the midwife to walk beside and support birthing women, babies, families, and the communities. I want to join with the theme of justice, the journeys, communities, and resistance, as set, spoken to by Father Christopher just now. As I say to the women when we were doing Aquinato, girls, we are birthing the world. Remember, we have the strongest muscle in the human body, the womb. And in the words of the indigenous midwife, Kachi Cook, the woman is the first environment. We understand that it is from this environment that our world is born and created. The first 1001 days of a human being's life sets the framework for its existence, short term, long term, and the intergenerational imprinting through the DNA. Our body's immune system is set for the intervention and the prevention of many non-communicable diseases like heart disease, diabetes, even the way we live our lives and its longevity. Poor, insensitive maternity care blights us on the vine. And if we think of the umbilical cord as a vine, it blights us on the vine, affecting us through economic systems, educational systems, spiritual well-being, our ability to communicate, preventative health care, mental and physical health care, and even the criminal justice system. And birth, despite the sometimes overreach of multiple technologies into our tender and vulnerable minds and bodies, it is a physiological process. That is not to say that some of our community's women won't need help and support from the best and appropriate technological and medical kind. As midwives, our remit is balanced between an art and a science of birth. Our code of practice in the United Kingdom requires us to prioritize people, amongst other things. Worldwide, we are, some would say, the oldest profession, we do acknowledge midwives helping childbearing women and their families from time immemorial. Much is written and spoken about in the annals of human histories. However, midwives, being largely a female dominated profession, can also and do receive negative treatments and experience similar poor societal regard. Given its critical importance to all societies, childbirth currently is in somewhat of a bit of a crisis, a downward spiral in terms of attention to detail and few fundamental solutions for remedy. Across the world, including the United Kingdom, our midwife numbers are diminishing, exacerbated by the terrible COVID-19 pandemic. This finds increasing numbers of women seeking safety, also in times of war. With their perception of discrimination and ill treatment on a variety of grounds of race, of age, class, disabilities, some are even choosing to birth alone to avoid such lifelong trauma. And so it was that I was led to advocating for reproductive justice 
on my return from traveling back in 2001. My nurse training had also had me wondering about the old ladies I was nursing. They were crying in the night about their long held wish to have seen their babies who were stillborn or who had died and they were not allowed to do that. That really impacted me in terms of how it is we support women to birth and to nurture and to heal themselves from trauma. Already myself grounded within a nurturing family, I had a wonderful nurse and midwife training and a love and passion for culturally safe care for all, including myself. This found me in the words of Paul, Dr. Paul Farmer, MD, an anthropologist, may he rest in eternal peace. He set up partners in health in Haiti. He says, human rights violations are not accidents. They are not random in distribution or effect. Rights violations are rather symptoms of deeper pathologies of power and are linked intimately to the social conditions that so often determine who will suffer abuse and who will be shielded from harm. Despite many barriers and challenges, my dear midwife colleague, Yvonne White, who is sitting there, and I have clubbed together to support local communities, their women, however they come to us. We use the African concept of Sankofa, of looking back to understand and then going forward with a solution. We utilize all our knowledge, our skills, and the gifts we have received along the way to help women to birth to their needs, to their values, whatever these may be. We embed cultural safety, which helps to ameliorate these violations. It puts the parturient woman at the center of her care, and it empowers her to choose the care she deems as safe. This is irrespective of her class, her culture, her religion or none, her spirituality or indeed her status. Cultural safety is a New Zealand nursing competence. It recognizes the impact of power structures, both within and without the hospital or the medical space. It requires clinicians and organizations to reflect and to repair their approach for the best outcomes. So in a small way, some of the most awesome beginnings have arisen from this way of care. And I have to recall one of the sweetest births that we've ever attended was a Muslim family, a home birth, and the baby who was born to the Muslim prayer. That was just awesome. So as some midwives would say, peace on earth, begins with birth. And in closing, I would again like to thank my dear friends in this community for the unique opportunity to share my thoughts, my work, and to learn from what this community has shared with us. I just want to share my daily prayer to myself. May today there be peace within. May you trust that you are exactly where you are meant to be. May you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith in yourself, others, and God. May you use the gifts that you have received and pass on the love that has been given to you. May you be content with yourself just the way you are. Let this knowledge settle into your bones and allow your soul the freedom to sing, to dance, to pray, and to love. It is there for each and every one of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elsie, for those insightful words. Just a couple of announcements. There will be a selection of the latest publications by AMI Press available for sale at, um, by the entrance. 
cash and card payments are both accepted. Tomorrow night's programme will start at 7.33pm, inshallah, with namaz, and it will be followed with the Waikumel. After the Waikumel, there will be a lecture, and then, inshallah, we'll conclude with ziyarat. After tonight's ziyarat, the refreshments will be served in the dining room, so please feel free to have your refreshments either in the dining room or in the front garden. Before I let you all go, can I ask Sheikh Mahmoud to give us a few words? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm not sure how happy you might be to see me. You might think that whenever you see me, it is some kind of fundraising going on. No? But alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I want to share some very, very good news with you. Uh, but some other news first. One is that even this time, as is our norm, inshallah, we will be highlighting uh, two causes. One is the, of course, what none of us have missed are the devastating floods in Pakistan. And then we are going to be highlighting a particular project of the AMI. So the good news is, alhamdulillah, with the grace of God and your generosity for the Yemen appeal, we raised more than 10,800 pounds. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. You might just see a figure, but this figure is translated into lives being transformed and changed and potentially saved. Babies provided with nourishing formula, food parcels to families, widows and orphans supported. And as we said, we have not missed the call now that has come from Pakistan. And today, I don't really want to talk about Pakistan in my own words, but instead, we're going to play a clip. This clip is coming from the ground in Pakistan, sent from a person who is working with our uh, collaborating agency, Beta Charitable Trust, about the situation. This is a few days after the floods had struck. Uh, Sheikh Ali Rada, if you could kindly Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Listen to oh. it and transport your thoughts to that Barakatuh khuda apko sehat de salamati de sehab ki jo tabakariya hain wo bayan nahi kar sakta insaan aur logon ki calls aa rahi hain. رو رو کے کہتے ہیں ہم ہمارے بچے بھوک سے مر رہے ہیں اور ہم آسمان تلے ہیں نیچے پانی ہے ہر طرف پانی ہے پینے کا پانی نہیں ہے بہت مشکل حالات میں ہیں لوگ لیکن ابھی ان تک مدد پہنچانا بھی مشکل ہے اور سیلاب کا فلڈ کا زور زیادہ سے زیادہ ہوتا جا رہا ہے ہم ان شاء اللہ بہت جلد یہ پہنچائیں گے لوگوں تک آپ کی طرف سے آپ کے بہت شکریہ بہت مہربانی خدا آپ کو اپنے حفظ و امان میں رکھے سو موسٹ He's saying the situation is, is catastrophic. There is water everywhere, but there is no water to drink. This just would summarize the situation to you. If you wish to support this, you can see me at the desk by the foyer at the entrance. Finally, could we recite a Surah Fatiha for all the Marhumeen whom tonight has been dedicated for and for all the marid and for those 